here today. I'm Navneet Singh, your host for this webinar. I know that today's topic will bring up a number of questions from you. So you may type your questions in chat box and I want to let you know that we will address as many as we can in the time we have today. And I welcome and request our NBMS National Webinar Coordinator, Professor Dr. Soma Shekhar, to start this session. Welcome, sir. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Navneet Singh Ji. And uh, students, first of all, congratulations for all those who are clear. Uh, those who couldn't make it, please don't lose heart. You know, all the time, uh, exams may not be the only place your knowledge can be reflected. There are various factors, the case, the time, and the place. So please don't get dejected. At this level, one attempt, it just doesn't matter. You know, you just take it as a godsend opportunity to maybe revise again, cement your knowledge, and all of you will definitely clear it next time. Uh, so, and then, so since the practicals are over, now I shifted gear to discuss more of uh, journals, knowledge and recent advances. And the most burning topic today is, you know, after we switched over to TNT and then also the conventional chemo RT, what to do with the clinical complete responder, wait and watch or should we really operate? And especially in the last ASCO, there were two more papers, one from UK and one from Canada, which got analyzed. And we already had the Huber Gamma data. So uh, this time, Arjun and Nikunj, two of our uh, senior DNB surgical oncology students, are debating for and against. And who better than very two senior, uh, my colleagues, professors, uh, Dr. Ram Krishna from Adair and Jagannath Dixit from HCG Bangalore. Uh, Avni Saklani, if time permits, he will join because he is traveling. Who will do an expert comment about pros and cons. Remember, in medicine, there is no absolute yes or no. No absolute truth or false. Uh, there is something, the truth actually lies in between both of them. The way you read in between the line of each trial, understand the pros and cons, the right subset of patient who fit to do that and not to generalize for everywhere is the art and knowledge of, you know, medicine. And for that, you need two great mentors. And thank you very much, Ramakrishna and Jagannath, to actually sparing your time, accepting our invitation from DNB board. Thank you very much. And uh, over to Arjun to start the first debate. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I shall be talking about watch and wait in rectal cancer. The initial phase started off by comparing preoperative versus postoperative chemotherapy for rectal cancer. And uh, this study was initially conducted with Sawyer et al. All locally advanced cases, stage 2 or stage 3 cancers were either randomized to chemo RT followed by total mesorectal excision or initially total mesorectal excision followed by postoperative chemotherapy. And in this, he figured out that postoperative for those patients who were offered preoperative CRT, the local recurrence was only around 6%. But for those patients who were offered postoperative CRT, the local recurrence was more than double, approximately around 13%. Therefore, preoperative CRT became the standard of care for rectal cancer. And as was mentioned earlier, the local recurrence for postoperative CRT is roughly double, around 13%. <clears throat> Therefore, the current gold standard is radical surgical excision, such as either an anterior resection and AR or an abdominal perineal resection, which is an APR following the TME principle. What do we need to know for watch and wait in rectal cancer at this point of time? The what is, we need to avoid surgery in rectal cancer for early stage rectal cancer patients. Why? A rectal cancer surgery carries a very high morbidity, somewhere between 6 and 35%, which includes bleeding, sepsis, and, and anastomotic dehiscence. This is also associated with long-term functional issues such as bubble, bladder, sexual dysfunction, which has a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. Uh, this is offered usually to rectal cancer patients who are undergoing neoadjuvant therapy which, uh, or undergoing CRT prior to surgery. What is uh, what do we hope to achieve by this? We hope to achieve a clinical uh, hope to achieve a complete response. We need to identify a clinical complete response, also known as a CCR. And there's all we also need to hope that a clinical complete response means a pathological complete response. More in this presentation, we shall be dealing with how to identify a clinical complete response and. How do we, what are the factors which equate for a clinical complete response equating to a pathological complete response? The initial study or one of the seminal works which was done on this topic was done by uh, Angelita Habergama in 2004. This was one of the, this was the first study which was published on this topic. 
she took up a total number of patients as of two sixty five, and uh, complete response group was approximately twenty five percent or seventy one patients, and incomplete response was somewhere around one ninety four patients or seventy five percent of the patients. Uh, both of the groups were uh, almost evenly staged. But one of the criticisms which this study attracted was because she had included quite almost, or if you see out of 71 patients, approximately 20% of patients were T2 group patients. And T2 patients, if we recall, if we can recall, are those patients who are usually not offered CRT upfront. But she countered this by saying that uh, T2 patients were those, uh, these T2, only those T2 patients were offered CRT for whom the primary surgery would have been an abdominal perineal dissection. Therefore, those patients were offered uh, a CRT before the surgery. The overall survival for observation group was slightly higher uh, according to this, but the disease-free survival was, uh, was overall equal compared to both the groups. The next study, which was again done by Habergama, was in 2017, where, she tried, where, here, where the researcher tried to equate the baseline T classification and seeing whether it predicted early tumor regrowth after non-operative management. Basically, what the researcher was trying to see in this was whether it makes a difference whether prior to CRT, the patient was either a T2 as compared to a T3, T4 to see whether it made any change in local tumor regrowth. Again, all rectal cancer patients, either a T3 or an N plus patients were taken and they were ran and they were offered CRT. Post 10 weeks, when they had achieved a clinical complete response, the clinical complete response in this case was checked by digital rectal examination and digit proctoscopy at 10 weeks from the date of last date of radiotherapy completion. <clears throat> in this, we can see that this is the baseline tumor growth. We can see a, we can see a tumor in this. At eight weeks post completion of CRT, we can see that the tumor has disappeared. The only the only remnant of the tumor, as we can see over here, is the bit of whitening over here, and also the various telangiectatic vessels which can be seen in this. Therefore, a clinical con uh, complete response was considered in the presence of either a normal DRE or only in the presence of subtle induration, presence of whitening of the mucosa, telangiectasia without any ulceration, massa, stenosis of the rectum on an MRA weight, diffusion-weighted imaging. What is the follow-up strategy we offer usually to those patients who have been offered the watch and wait? Every, every two months for the first year, we shall be following the patients up with a digital rectal examination, a rigid proctoscopy, and also routine management uh, monitoring of CEA levels for the first two months. Follow it up with every three months for the second year, and every six months from the third year thereafter, usually until the time period of five, five years, and then also after that. MRA can be done every six months for is usually done every six months for the first three years and then yearly thereafter. PET CT can be added if suspicious, although as we shall be discussing in later slides, PET CT is notoriously insensitive for the for determining uh, complete response in case of uh, CA rectum patients. Chest or abdominal CT can also be offered every six months for the first two years and every year thereafter, and also a PET CT can be added if suspicions exist. <laughs> Early recurrence is usually classified as that recurrence which occurs less than at less than a one year from the duration of completion of therapy. Late recurrence are those which occur more than a year after completion of therapy. Uh, as can be seen in the same study, the same study which was done by Habagama in 2017, post the clinical complete response, if there is evidence of any local tumor regrowth, salvage TME can be offered for these patients. As is seen in this, for post neoj one CRT, those patients who had an incomplete response, they were directly randomized to TME. But for those patients with complete response, they were kept on follow-up, as was mentioned in the previous slides. For clinical T2 or T3 patients with an early regrowth, which is within 12 months, these patients were offered salvage therapy. And, and these patients were salvaged at APR and they are still alive with lung meds. And some people have, uh, some uh, some of the patients had disease due to lung meds and also due to a local relapse. For those patients who had a sustained clinical complete response after 12 months, again for T2 and T3 patients with late recurrence, they were again salvaged. And as can be seen over here, one only only one patient disease of local relapse and one had palliative therapy due to simultaneous systemic relapse, whereas the rest of the patients are still alive, even with a lung relapse. <coughs> Uh, in the baseline T classification, as was noted by Habagama, 
he compares yeah, the researcher compared T2 versus T3 and T4 tumors. Initial complete response when when compared between these two categories, it is seen that initial complete response was noted in a uh, noted in 71 percent of patients, approximately 72 percent of patients with T2 tumors, as compared only to 63 percent of T3 and T4 tumors. The early regrowths were seen only in 3.6 percent of T2 tumors, as compared to more than 30 percent of first patients with T3 tumors. Also, the complete response was noted in a staggering 93 percent in T2. Only around 70% in T3, and also the similar, and also similarly, the systemic recurrences were also noted to be higher in T3, T4 as compared to T2 tumors, as has been highlighted in this study as well. Therefore, uh, the method was where rectal cancer was treated with CRT followed by surgery, as done by Sawyer et al. To mostly stage one rectal cancer treated with CRT and followed up with observation of CCR was achieved, as seen by Habagama. Therefore, the, the, this result was significant in that. CRT followed by surgery is more appropriate for stage 2, stage 3 and CRT followed by observation is more appropriate for stage 1 cancers and this result was significant. <coughs> the local recurrence free survival also was noticed to be lower in T3, T4 tumors and noticed to be higher in uh, T2 tumors. The distant disease free survival was also noted to be higher in T2 tumors and lower in T3, T4 tumors. <coughs> Therefore, the researcher postulated in the 2017 study that clinical T2 patients who develop complete clinical response after extended chemo radiation managed non-operatively are less likely to develop early tumor regrowth as when compared to T3, T4 tumors. Also, it is not that T3, T4 patients should not be offered a watch and wait, but they should just be undergoing more intensive follow-up after a complete clinical response in order to allow for early detection of early regrowth. The next study of significance which was done on this was done by Monique Maas in 2011 where he, where the researcher also followed a wait and see policy for clinical complete responders after chemo radiation for rectal cancer. And again, rectal cancer patients, T3, T4 patients were randomized to chemo RT and then after 8 to 10 weeks they were, when the clinical complete response had been achieved, the patients were followed up. In case of regrowth, the patients were offered salvage TME. But if, we, if, if you would remember, in Habar Gama, the primary mode of clinical assessing clinical complete response was by DRE and proctoscopy. Whereas over here, the primary mode of follow-up for uh, cl assessing clinical complete response has been with MRI and endoscopy. Only one patient developed a local recurrence and had surgery as a salvage treatment. And the other 20 patients are alive without disease, which goes to show that wash and wait has a very important part of rectal cancer in the present day scenario. The next study which was done on this phase was also the non-operative management of rectal cancer, which was done by Smith et al. <coughs> and this study also went on to prove that the three-year DFS and the recurrence-free survival was similar compared to non-operative and the standard of care. So how were those patients identified for whom we will be identified, for whom we will be offering, uh, for, for how do we judge clinical complete response for those patients who have been offered current CRT? The primary methods for assessing are clinically either with a digital rectal examination plus or minus an endoscopic biopsy or a magnetic resonance tumor regression grading system about which we shall be discussing in more detail or with a PET scan. There is, as of now, there is no consensus on which or how many of these methods or which of this has the best significance. Although the cardinal signs of incomplete tumor, incomplete tumor response was have been assessed to be deep ulceration with or without necrosis superficial ulceration or mucosal irregularity or a palpable nodule despite mucosal irregularity or significant stenosis. Smith et al. said that all of these factors have significant sensitivity, although it has been proven that all of these factors have no sensitivity. Ultimately, even for those patients who have signs of incomplete clinical response and when these patients are offered surgery, up to 61% of these patients were seen to be pathological complete responders, which goes on to show that none of these factors are actually quite sensitive. As was mentioned earlier, the MRTRG or the magnetic resonance tumor regression grade is one of the factors which are being used to assess clinical complete response. It is usually staged from grade 1 to grade 5, where grade 1 shows a radiological complete response. 2 is good response and then onwards until grade 5 has no response where it has the same appearance as original tumor or tumor regrowth. <laughs> as can be seen in this picture, uh, pre-operative CRT or MRI, we can see the significant growth in this. 
where whereas this is an MR TRG one which shows an excellent response where there's only a radial or a crescentic scar up to one to two mm which is seen in the mucosa or the submucosa which shows an excellent response. Uh, one of the studies which was done, a similar study which was done on this topic was by Bude et al. Where he, where the researcher compared magnetic resonance to a TRG and residual mucosal abnormality as predictors for PCR in rectal cancer post CRT. 31 of 32 patients who had an MR TRG score of 4 to 5, which is a very poor score, had residual humor, which shows that this equates very well. And approximately 17 of 18 patients with MR TRG of 1 to 3, which shows a very good response, had achieved a pathological complete response. Another study which was done by Mass et al., as was mentioned earlier, 50 patients 6 to 8 weeks after CRT, they were evaluated by a combination of DRE plus endoscopy or a T2-weighted MRI, T2 weighted MRI or a diffusion weighted MRI. And out of this, it was seen that under the ROC curve, an MRI including diffusion weighted imaging and clinical assessment, both of these had the highest uh, sensitivity in order to determine a clinical complete response. In this study, it is seen that a positive post-test probability is the probability of clinical complete response when both tests have positive results. And a negative probability is the probability of complete response when both tests have negative results. This means that when clinical assessment and T2-weighted MRA, if both of these are positive, it shows that the positive test or the possibility of a complete response is approximately 98%. On the other hand, if both of these tests are negative, the, path the complete response is still quite significant. It can be seen in approximately 15% of patients. The trigger trial was done to compare the magnetic resonance uh, TRG as a biomarker for stratified management. In the control arm was offered surgery. The intervention arm, post MRI scan, uh, the, uh, if there was a good response which was seen on the MR TRG, the surgery was deferred. And uh, consolidation chemotherapy was offered and then the patient was put on surveillance protocol. On the other hand, if the patient had a poor response, the patient was offered chemotherapy and then the patient was offered surgery. Other methods to look for complete response are also the MR resist criteria, where the reduction of craniocaudal length more than or equal to 50% was considered as good response. MR volumetric analysis where reduction of tumor volume more than or equal to 80% was considered as good response. One of the main problems which is seen with assessing a complete response or to evaluate a complete response, especially by biopsy, is the principle or the phenomenon of tumor scatter. Most of the tumor burden after neo therapy appears to be located at the invasive front or the deepest layer of the bubble wall, suggesting that only a full thickness or an excisional biopsy could accurately detect residual malignancy. Unfortunately, more than 50, approximately 50% 50 of the cancer cells are located outside the visible ulcer. If you remember the cardinal signs as mentioned earlier, one of the most cardinal signs was the presence of visible ulcer. And in this slide, it is seen that approximately 50% of the cancer cells are actually located outside this visible ulcer or deeper to normal appearing mucosa. The mean distance of distal scatter ranges from 1 cm from the visible edge to a maximum of 3 cm, which indicates that neither gross ulceration nor the traditional 2 cm margin can be used to adequately guide biopsy or excision of the potential residual tumor. So, in order to counteract this, even if we thought that doing a complete full thickness excision of the tumor site and all remaining potential cancer cells were accomplished, a sterile specimen unfortunately still does not guarantee complete nodal response. Although the rate of lymph node involvement in patients with a YP T0 lesion is small, it's still not zero. It's approximately 8 or 9 percent in recent reports and therefore there is ultimately no conclusive method for determining a PCR short of total mesenteric excision. Uh, we have there, there have been certain nomograms to predict lymph node positivity in order to contract this phenomenon of tumor scatter. These the seven factors which are included in this are young age, a low Charleston comorbidity score, mucinous histology, poorly differentiated and undif undifferentiated tumors, lymphovascular invasion, elevated CA level, and clinical lymph node positivity. This aids in clinical decision making when an organ sparing approach is being considered. The main study which was done on this was the OPERA study of the organ preservation of rectal adenocarcinoma, which was uh, published in 2015. In this, uh, CA rectum patients, MRA stage 2 or 3 cancers were randomized either to ARM1 induction chemo, with fall, both of them are offered Folfox and Kepiox, with induction chemo followed by CRT or CRT followed by consolidation chemotherapy, and both of them were restaged. 
If there was no significant clinical response, they were offered TME. If there was a significant clinical response, they were uh, randomized to non-operative management. The take-home message from this opera study was total neoadjuvant therapy, where all of the neoadjuvant treatment is offered prior to surgery improves survival. Total neoadjuvant therapy also decreases the amount of time on an ileostomy post surgery if done, and also selectively avoiding surgery, which is the wash and wait or the premise of this presentation, improves quality of life and also has significant economic benefits if used in a properly structured way. There were also certain studies which compared the duration which can be uh, which we can wait after CRT for six to eight weeks versus longer. A study which was done randomized patients with clinical complete response into watch and wait group number one after eight to ten weeks after CRT. On the other hand, if at eight to ten weeks they had a near complete clinical response, a further duration of waiting of up to six to eight weeks was done. And at this point of time, when they had achieved a clinical complete response, they were stratified into another group, which is the watch and wait group number two. And on the basis of all the studies which are done, it was seen that for watch and wait one and two. The two-year overall survival was nearly equal, approximately around 98 to 99 percent. Total neoadjuvant therapy, which has been in vogue right now, it is it is seen that for those patients who are offered folfox, capiox, then then CRT, compared to CRT post adjuvant chemotherapy, which was the usual therapy, which was the usual treatment before TNT was started, it is seen that with TNT, the sustained clinical complete response at 12 months is seen in approximately 92 percent as compared to only 79% for whom adjuvant chemotherapy is offered post-surgery. Therefore, for TNT, it is seen that the percentage of no surgery or for whom wash and wait can be successfully offered is approximately 22%, whereas it is only 6% for conventional. Therefore, TNT is a must if we are considering organ preservation strategies for rectal cancer. <coughs> The Encore project is a study which is being done right now where 109 patients were taken in each uh, fraction in each uh, arm. The primary endpoint was non regrowth disease free survival. And on the basis of the MAD surgical controls, it was seen that there was no difference in three year either disease free survival or overall survival. And it was also seen in the study that the most of the recurrences were seen at approximately two years post completion of CRD. Therefore, this is the period for which most of the uh, intensive surveillance must be done. Another study or one of the most important databases for this is the International Watch and Wait Database, also known as the IWWD, which is done by Maxime et al. And more than 1,000 patients have been accrued in this for whom, uh, for those patients for whom uh, watch and wait has been offered. And it was seen on the basis of this that most of the recurrences uh, occurred endoluminally. Most of more than, uh, approximately 25% of the recurrences were noticed in the first two years. And more than 98% of these recurrences were noticed endoluminally. Therefore, endoscopy is a very important part of watch and wait uh, uh, strategy. San Julio et al. also published another study where conditional survival in patients with rectal cancer post CRT and CCR was seen. And in this study, he noted this, uh, the researcher noted that most of the recurrences were seen within the first two years post CRT and a CCR. And post this, there's a less than 10% chance of a patient developing a uh, they are developing a local tumor regrowth and post two years he also the researcher also noticed that there was the impact of a T stage on a local T growth becomes significantly lesser as was noted earlier by Habarkama who said that T3D4 had a higher chance of local tumor regrowth the impact of this becomes lesser after two years the one of the most important studies which has been done in recent times is the Star Trek phase 2 trial where can we save the rectum by watchful waiting or transcendental surgery following CRT? Patients with biopsy proving adenocarcinoma of the rectum stage with magnetic resonance staging were randomized upon this to one ratio to TME or organ preservation via mesorectal short course RT or organ preservation via mesorectal chemo RT. Standardized response assessment classified organ preservation cases are either a complete response for CR for observation, partial response for attempts, or poor response for TME by 20 weeks. These patients were kept on surveillance and it was noticed that this the, process, the principle of organ preservation reduced acute surgical morbidity without introducing substantial radiation toxicity. The overall quality of life was evenly matched. The Star Trek phase 3 trial is accruing patients right now because the phase 2 trial was highly successful. Sorry for interrupting Dr. Arjun but I think you have to wind up. I am done sir. One more speaker. Yes sir, we are done. 
therefore the pros of this are there's a better quality of life it is better for early t stage tumors spares patients uh, spares the patient from complications of surgery and patients can be offered the salvage tme even after local regrowth post the wash and wait approach the cons are that it requires extra intensive surveillance no consensus or investigation which can predict a clinical complete response and it is not the standard of care yet thank you sir i'm done Uh, Dr. Arjun, uh, good presentation. Can you just summarize the among all the thing three four important salient points? You just summarize in thirty seconds. <coughs> Sir, on the basis of wash and wait, it was seen that uh, it can be or wash and wait should be offered in a structured way, preferably for early T stage tumors or T two tumors who've been offered CRT on the basis of studies which are done by Habarkama. it can be offered for later stage tumors t3 t4 as well but the surveillance needs to be more intensive it offers better quality of life it has significant economic benefits as well patients are spared from the morbidity of surgery the various bubble and bladder complications which can occur the complications of anastomotic dehiscence therefore wash and wait if offered in a structured way definitely has a part in modern day medicine and surgery so in a given a chance out of 10 how many patients you want to do this uh, wnw Uh, sir this depends on the post op on the clinical complete response and on the mr trg as well if i evaluate the patients and they are seen to have a clinical complete response if the patients have been counseled if they are willing for wash and wait then the patients can be offered if they have a ccr okay sir. thank you yeah. thank you sir yeah dr uh, chauhan you can start your presentation yes sir please stick to the time yes sir a uh, good morning uh, all faculties and my colleagues uh, as my friend already has spoken in favor of the uh, watch and wait i will be uh, speaking uh, against the watch and wait so rectal cancer is not a single entity it is a spectrum of disease with a uh, plethora of the management approaches with the endoscopic excision up to the sphincter saving procedures like isr and there is a, a different uh, pre operative therapies which can be offered to patient uh, as we have seen so my friend has already uh, spoken on the evolution of rectal cancer treatment it started with tme and then uh, came the pre operative chemo radiation and then uh, can the approaches like a uh, total ear joint therapy and organ preservation currently uh, is offered in the uh, rectal cancer treatment so uh, the prime focus of uh, treatment in rectal cancer as we can see the focus has changed from the local regional control then to the distant mets control sphincter preservation and now we are talking about the organ preservation so watch and wait my uh, friend has already spoken about it it is mainly offered in the distal rectal cancer after new adjuvant chemo radiation and a waiting period of 8 to 10 weeks after the completion of radiation and patients who sustain this uh, up to the 12 months they are entered into a strict surveillance protocol but what are the issues with watch and wait is local regrowth most of them are salvageable but we have to see how much is the stoma rate so issues with watch and wait first i will uh, say is uh, there is a heterogeneity in definition of complete clinical response all the studies which have been seen mostly they use the same criteria for this uh, response assessment still there is a heterogeneity in definition of complete clinical response and there is no uh, clear cut criteria second issue is uh, with the watch and wait is the nature of its uh, this therapy so we know the intent of near joint chemo radiation in rectal uh, locally advanced rectal cancer started to improve the r0 resection rate to decrease the local recurrence and uh, to achieve the sphincter preservation but the watch and wait is accidental and opportunistic mostly it has been used in patients who refuse surgery and those who are unfit for surgery this uh, approach is uh, popularized in these patients and there is no effective predicting factors to uh, predict that which patients among this will have complete clinical response third issue is the patient selection as previous speaker has already told that the t2 n0 patients will not need 
the radiation or chemotherapy in their um, course of the treatment are also subjected to the toxicities of chemotherapy and radiation. And we know that pelvic radiotherapy is not a straight away simple um, strategy. It is also, also associated with morbidity. And as we know that uh, in the initial uh, study, the super selection of patients is considered that patients who have an early regrowth on watch and wait, they are not compared. But the patients who sustain uh, this uh, complete clinical response after 12 months, they are compared with the pathological complete response. Next issue is the response assessment. So di uh, digital rectal exam uh, examination, it is highly subjective. It depends on surgeon's experience. Next is the endoscopy, which can detect only mucosal abnormality. EUS can be used to uh, see the uh, mural uh, remnant, but we don't know the sensitivity. MRI, as in most of the studies, it has been MRTRG has uh, a good uh, evaluation of the complete clinical response, but it can rule out complete clinical response, but it cannot determine it. Now, biggest question is when to do response assessment. We know that different trials has men, uh, mentioned different period. We have to wait eight weeks and in some trials, they are told up to 18 weeks. So there is no standardization about the response assessment when to do it. The Hebergema data they have shown that up to 73% of the patients on uh, uh, chemo radiation, they will achieve the complete clinical response only after 16 weeks. weeks. And the dictum says that longer you wait, more complete clinical responders you will find. But how long to wait? There is no clarity. Next issue is the discordance between complete clinical response and pathological complete response. It cannot be used as a surrogate of each other. So this is a study, uh, a data from uh, MSKCC, where they have compared the patient, uh, pathological complete response and uh, clinical complete response. They have seen that uh, the patients with pathological complete response, only 25% of the patient had complete clinical response. On the other side, the 75% of the patients with complete clinical response still has a viable tumor cells. And unfortunately, 60% out of this has a higher grade even after the treatment. It is T2 or T3 patients. And 23% of the patient had not positive residual disease. It is not seen only in the one series but uh, it is seen across the trial, the higher discordance rate between complete clinical response and pathological complete response. Next issue is the residual mucosal abnormalities and tumor scatter. As my friend has already spoken few points on it, I would like to add some points. So this is us, uh, FM Smith and colleagues, they have uh, done a pathological study. They have found that mucosal findings are not associated with pathological complete response. So 61% of the patients with pathological complete response, they were having some residual mucosal abnormalities despite a pathological complete response. And uh, the uh, 2014 data, this figure is up to the 74%. Next issue is the tumor scatter. So Smith have, uh, FM Smith and colleague, they have uh, done a pathological study and they have find out that the response to near joint chemo radiation of a tumor is not a downsizing and then disappearance of the tumor, but it is in fragmentation. So uh, the tumor scatter is seen uh, away uh, up to one centimeter from the residual mucosal abnormalities. So a uh, local excision of the residual mucosal abnormality will give us a false negative margins. Next issue is the local regrowth. So we have seen that across the different uh, studies, the local recurrence range from 2.8% to 40%. So most of the uh, groups, they have said that local regrowth is salvageable in more than 90% of the situation. But what about APR rate at salvage situation? So this is the data from uh, the DOSA uh, meta-analysis where the, we can see that uh, in some of the series, the APR rate is 100%. That most of the salvage situations are... Um, most of them are salvage situation, but the with the uh, at the cost of high APR rate. So whether we approaching, uh, whether we are offering this patient uh, organ preservation or just deferring this until the regrowth. Next issue is with the morbidity and dysfunction. So as we have seen that uh, in most of the studies, it is highlighted that the rectal uh, surgery for rectal cancer has a lot of morbidity 
stoma and the dysfunction. But as we can see that in organ preservation protocol, uh, it has local excision is compared with the TME. We can't see a much difference between the major morbidity and the uh, sexual and uh, urogenital dysfunction. So chemo radiation is nearly a equally toxic therapy as surgery and there is a gray zone at present about the quality of life of patients who are on watch and wait after uh, chemo radiation. With improving stroma technologies, we know that uh, still there are a good number of patients who can have a, a acceptable quality of life with stoma also. And with the improvement and um, routine availability of the minimal invasive surgery, we can see that higher magnification, these are improving in nerve preservation and precision surgery, and it leads to good functional outcome. Next issue is with the not positive disease. So this is a Ducales uh, and Calix data where they have done the pathological not, uh, correlation between the pathological nodal status and the survival outcome. So as we can see that after uh, patients who have responded good at the primary site, the YPT0TIS, even the, in these patients, there is a pathological node in 7% of the patients. And when it becomes to T1, the figure doubles to 14%. And definitely there is a, a decrease in the survival associated with pathological nodal status. In wait and watch, we don't have a sensitive or a accurate uh, method to predict the nodal status, except the MRI. Next issue is the survival outcome. As the previous spe uh, speaker already spoken that the DFS and overall survival are uh, comparable between the watch and wait and pathological complete response. But what about the patients who have local regrowth after watch and wait? So uh, the Joshua Smith and colleague, they have studied that uh, the patients, the distant metastasis rate in the patients who develop local regrowth after watch and wait, their survival is worst. The uh, incidence of distant meds, it's up to 36%, which is very high and not acceptable. What about the compliance to this uh, stringent surveillance protocol? So we know that in our country like India, we know the patients, uh, we see this type of patients in our OPD, that even a visible disease, they don't neglect it for early diagnosis and treatment. How to expect the strict surveillance protocol of uh, clinical examination, endoscopy and MRI. And definitely we will be overburdening our uh, current under resourced facilities for uh, cancer treatment. And what about the uh, situations like pandemic to follow up these patients? Next issue is the reproducibility of the early promising results. We have seen that Hebagema and dif in different groups, they have uh, given a promising results about watch and wait. It looks attractive, but there is no reproducibility of results about uh, the, all the groups. And we can see that uh, the distant, uh, distant metastasis and local recurrences, there is still uh, no clarity. Next issue is that it is why it has not become still a standard of care as we know that it has been started around 1998 but still after this many years why it has not become a standard of care we, still uh, in a locally advanced uh, rectal cancer the standard of care is uh, chemo radiation with or without total neurogen therapy followed by surgery and adjuvant treatment uh, this uh, uh, Interesting data from the uh, Sao Liao and colleagues, they have done a survey uh, among the physicians who are treating uh, colorectal cancer and we can see that still in uh, 2013 also there is hesitancy about the um, approach of watch and wait. But still it can be offered to some of the selected patients like elderly, those patients who refuse surgery and patients with comorbidity who, are have, who will uh, be having difficult to manage uh, stoma. What about the baseline organ function uh, to the patients we, whom we offer organ preservation? So distal rectal cancer with sphincter involvement will be definitely going for APR. We don't have a baseline anorectal dysfunction assessment of this patient and we are blanketly uh, giving a option of organ preservation. As we know that the organ preservation is standard of care in carcinoma larynx, but there we uh, consider the functional uh, functional aspect of larynx, those patients who don't have a functional larynx, we don't offer organ preservation. So in uh, future studies, we have to incorporate base baseline functional assessment of the rectum. 
What about the organ preservation in TNT era? So as my friend already spoken about the OPRA trial, so it is a phase two RCT recently published, but there is a heterogeneous uh, patient population with locally advanced rectal cancer. And if we see both the arms, they have compared TNT to TNT. There is no comparison with the standard of care. And they have included the patients who have achieved a near complete response also, which patients will require some form of adjuvant or further therapy, which patients are not treated. And they have dualistic objective of uh, comparing induction versus consolidation, and they are comparing watch and wait with TME. And it requires a longer follow-up data to embark upon. These are the so patients who to start with, they have locally advanced rectal cancer, T3, T4, not positive disease. In the, that patients, we are offering uh, organ preservation. Why not to offer this uh, organ preservation to early uh, rectal cancer patients? So these are the recent studies, totem study, where they have uh, done a prospective RCT, uh, giving this organ preser uh, exploring the organ preservation in T233 patients within 10 centimeter of the anal verge, less than 4 centimeter, and comparing the chemo radiation followed by uh, trans uh, anal endoscopic microsurgery against the TME. They have uh, shown the higher PCR uh, rates, low morbidity and complication rate, but long-term data we have to see. Another trial is the Star Trek trial with similar uh, study design. They are exploring the organ preservation in early rectal cancer. They have a good 60% organ preservation rate, but we have to wait for longer data. But the issues with local excision is which is the treatment in both the arms that we know we have seen that residual mucosal abnormalities and tumor scatter is a problem. And uh, uh, there is a high wound complication rates after local excision, which is higher than TME in uh, patients who are radi uh, radiated. And uh, we know that certain subsets of patients will not require a morbidity of uh, chemo and radiation with multimodality treatment that can be offered a curative resection with single modality of surgery, we are over-treating that uh, patient. And there is lack of predictors of complete clinical response, even though they are uh, considering the biomarkers and all that in uh, these trials, but we don't have uh, uh, confident data to look upon. So there is lack of level one evidence, no phase three data, no long-term outcome, and there is no non-inferiority trial yet to uh, confidently offer this uh, organ preservation to our patients. In summary, there is no standardization in patient selection. There's heterogeneity of definition of complete clinical response, response assessment, when to do it, and what to do during this waiting period. And definitely we don't know what will be the impact on outcome when these patients are waiting for uh, the response assessment. And uh, there is lack of accuracy of restaging modalities uh, uh, the last few decades, we are using the same modalities. We have to come up with some new modalities to assess. And there is possibility of residual microscopic disease. As we know that there is discordance between the CCR and PCR. And there is no, no standardization for new adjuvant therapy regimen. And as we know, the most of the patients with local regrowth are salvageable at the cost of high APR rate, high local and systemic recurrence, and the impact on survival. And there is lack of data long-term data and quality of life uh, of the patients who underwent watch and wait. So we have to wait, 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 and wait for watch and wait approach. Hope this waiting becomes shorter if it benefits the patients. Ultimately, patient is at the center of treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chauhan. Dr. Jagannath may offer a few comments. Uh, uh, morning, uh, Dr. Ram. Uh, actually, uh, you know, I think some more um, results has to evolve. Uh, probably, I think one from MSKCC, uh, you know, that one which is going to come in the next year, November, and uh, it might be the one of the best uh, uh, the datas which are going to come up. Uh, probably, we have to wait and see uh, another year or so. But, uh, you know, uh, wait and watch uh, is one of the uh, uh, real challenges in Indian scenario because uh, the patients, uh, ideal patients and then patients, uh, you know, risk stratification and uh, profiles of the patient, or how their uh, aggressive follow-up has to be done. And all these are the major, uh, you know, real hurdles in our day-to-day -day, uh, practice. So, I, I, I think... Uh, 
probably looking at uh, you know clinical radiological pathological and uh, uh, all the things into uh, picture probably we, we should uh, individualize the patients accordingly and uh, uh, look for but see the short term benefits uh, of wait and watch are good and uh, you know you know overall 33% will recur but uh, you know no difference in uh, in the survival in the salvage group versus the observation group see what we are looking now in oncology setup is something like quality of life so the patients with uh, you know having a good quality of life with wait and watch or you know survivors will be the role model for the next generation to come and probably they are the uh, you know people who can be the set uh, uh, the goals which can be set from the uh, from the this wait and watch policy so adding to that uh, probably uh, you know i think we are also looking at something called uh, uh, delayed surgery in some of the my personal uh, patients and then i found that uh, you know they they were also looking at uh, why this wait and watch policy was made and they could have been you know ready to undergo the similar surgery in the earlier setup so i had a lot of debate on some personal patients of mine and uh, it's really you know individualizing the patient and taking forward and uh, you know practically how it is applicable in our in our regular practice is a issue i think dr ram you can add up i think your is a it is a favorite topic of yours i think it'll be more uh, i like to hear from i like to hear from you ram uh good job uh, both of you let me just give a few general comments on uh, how you have presented the debate and then i will go on to more specific uh, issues regarding the content of your talk and uh, of what you write in general i uh, noticed that uh, the first speaker spent a lot of time uh, talking about the evolution and various trials on watch and wait please remember your uh talk today is not to give a summary or a review of the watch and wait approach you are here to present findings for watch and wait in the 20 odd minutes that you spoke except for the last few slides i had a feeling you were probably giving a summary of uh, watch and please uh, stick to the time limit and stick to what is uh, the current uh, topic you have to assume in going to a debate that uh, everybody knows the basics i mean i don't think anybody here would not be aware of all the initial trials of hubbard gamma and uh, the subsequent trials so uh, you have to take out points from each trials that are going to favor your argument that is watch and wait after a clinic please don't take it in the wrong sense this is a common mistake made by uh, most uh, people not just students but even by other speakers who i have uh, had a chance to uh, notice so if any time you talk in a debate you, you have to pause your arguments over 8 minutes you cannot do that then i think uh, you have not uh, been successful in proving your point so to do that you need to come straight to the point leave the history leave the evolution everybody knows that or at least assume that everybody knows from whatever is available in the literature take out those points which is going to favor your stand okay so that is just a uh, It was partly alluded to by uh, uh, I think the second speaker. Look at the later results. 
the opera trial, the Star Trek, these are all intentional watch and wait approaches. Meaning, you are inducing watch and wait. Even before you start treatment, your aim is to induce a complete internal response, thereby leading to a watch and wait approach if there is a complete internal response. So there is a heaven and hell difference between an intentional and an incidental watch and wait approach. So this is the reason why uh, there is a lot of criticism about uh, the earlier trials. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Manish had also mentioned in the chat box about uh, this criticism. So this is because most of the initial reports were incidental watching. So which brings us to the point, how do you do an intentional watching rate? So there are four main things you need to know. One is patient selection. Which patient do I offer the watch and wait for, approach for? Second, which is the neoadjuvant treatment that I'm going to plan to induce a complete clinical response? Third is how do I assess if the patient has got a complete clinical response? And four is how do I follow up a patient who has had a complete so again, this is the patient selection is where most of the misconceptions. The second speaker mentioned watch and wait has to be given, offered only to patients who are elderly, who have a lot of comorbids, and who are not willing for surgery. In my opinion, this is completely wrong. Watch and wait should not be offered to such patients. Watch and wait, the patient selection criteria, patients should be fit patient fit enough to undergo surgery, not many comorbidities. He must be motivated and willing for a watch and wait approach. At the same time, he must be willing to accept that he will need surgery if the watch and wait approach fails. See, the problem if you choose elderly patients with a lot of comorbidities who are not willing, is that remember to induce a watch uh, complete response, you need to give a good dose of radiation at least 50 gray or even 54 gray and follow it up with six cycles of chemotherapy. How do you expect an 80 year old patient with multiple comorbidities to extend all these treatments? So that is not the patient you should choose for an intentional watch and wait approach. I mean, you can offer it if you incidentally come across a complete response in such an elderly patient with a lot of comorbidities whom you are hesitant to offer surgery or if the patient is hesitant to undergo surgery. But please don't consider that as a true watch and wait approach. That is an incidental approach. You're offering watch and wait because you have no choice. That should not be how you select patients for a watch and wait. What are the other criteria that you should choose patients for? Patients should be motivated. The tumor should be T2 or a T3, less than a T3B tumor. Very advanced tumor is unlikely to have a complete clinical response. At the same time, a very early tumor, you are over-treating the patient with chemotherapy and radiation. There are certainly no babies. Don't select patients with signet ring cells or mucinous tumors for a watch and wait approach. Because MRI, which is part of the gold standard for assessment of response to radiation, is notoriously uh, insufficient in assessing the response in patients with a mucinous or a signet ring cell cancers. Then ideally don't choose patients with a circumferential tumors because the chances of circumferential tumors having a complete response is very low. Secondly, even if they do have a complete response, they tend to go in for stenosis or stricture. And a patient with a stricture, you should never choose for a watch and wait approach because you will not be able to assess them by endoscopy or a digital reflex. So these are a few uh, criteria to choose patients for an intentional watch and wait. So all these things should be decided before you plan the new treatment. Next, which is the new treatment regime that you should use? There are a lot of uh, regimens available now, thanks to all these recent trials. One thing for sure, giving only the standard chemo radiation, the chances of a complete people response is only 11 percent if you go by historical data. With the onset of TNT, this has gone up. The OPERA trial, even up to 50% had a complete clinical. So there are different methods you could choose. You could give uh, long course chemo radiation, go up on the radiation dose from the standard 50 gray, go up to 54 gray, and then give consolidation chemotherapy six cycles. 
or you can give induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation now even short course radiation the rapid protocol short course radiation followed by uh, six cycles of chemotherapy is being evaluated in fact they are doing a randomized trial at the institute comparing this approach versus the uh, long course chemo radiation followed by consolidation so there is still a uh, question as to which is the ideal neoadjuvant treatment that is required if you want to induce a complete cure the third question is how do you assess this patients the speakers correctly alluded to the various methods of uh, assessment so currently this, there is a consensus uh, i would like to disagree with the second speaker there is a consensus of how to assess these patients may not be the exact or the correct one but that is the consensus so like you have a triple assessment in breast cancer you have a triple assessment of response to neoadjuvant treatment in rectal cancer which consists of digital rectal examination sigmoidoscopy and mri each of them complement the other individually all of them may not be uh, very specific or sensitive but taken together they complement each other so with this triple assessment the accuracy rates of identifying patients with a complete initial response is as high as 98% i think was alluded to by one of the speakers <clears throat> pet ct scan <clears throat> at the moment as correctly pointed out by the first speaker is not very reliable i have seen many patients undergo a pet mri which is not an investigation that should be done for a rectal cancer biopsy is notoriously uh, uh, underestimates uh, complete neutral response it can overestimate also you have a lot of false uh, negative uh, rates so biopsy should not be done at all you are doing something you have to do a full thickness excision so there is a consensus on how you assess and if you do it correctly there is a nearly 98% accuracy in identifying a complete and the last is how do you follow up this patients again there is no clear consensus but what everybody agree is that they have to be on intensive surveillance at least for the first one or two years and mo most people practice an mri and an endoscopy and a digital rectal examination every 3 months for the first three years for the first year maybe every 4 months or 6 months from the second year onwards at least for 3 years this is these are the few points that you need to know when you consider a patient for a watch wait so coming to some of the points uh, which i noted down from what was uh, being discussed today uh, the second speaker mentioned that unless we have an non inferiority trial we will not get an answer to that while that may be very ideal leave alone a non inferiority trial even a superiority randomized trial in a watch and wait approach is never going to happen and this has been stated by many of the eminent uh, personalities who are uh done a lot of research in watch and wait because you tell the patient you have an option you going to be into a trial you have an option of either getting operated or not getting operated if you have a complete response nobody will agree in the option of getting operated that is the reason why you are never going to have a randomized trial so you cannot even think about a non inferiority trial because the numbers that are required are going to be huge so i think we have to go by what is the evidence available now some phase 3 trials are happening but they are not directly looking at patients with a complete response either undergoing surgery or not and you are also not going to get a randomized trial com uh, again comparing the standard chemo radiation versus chemo radiation or short course radiation followed by consolidation chemotherapy because now the world has now more or less switched to what total neoadjuvant treatment second speaker mentioned that opra did not have a clear definition of near complete response again that is wrong if you go into the protocol published of the opra trial they have a very beautiful table uh, in which they have defined what is an incomplete response what is a near complete response and what is a complete response based on the triple assessment that i just mentioned next if a tumor grows again after a watch and wait approach please do not call it a local reference the correct terminology that you use is a 
local regrowth. Speaking with uh, the local regrowth, the second speaker compared local regrowth to local recurrence, which is wrong. You cannot compare a local regrowth 36% to a local recurrence of less than 10%. Because most local regrowths are salvageable, and once salvaged, the survival of the patient is as good as if the patient had been operated upfront. There is enough evidence in the literature to support this. Again, if there is a local regrowth in salvage, there is a high APR rate, which was mentioned by the second speaker. We cannot uh, uh, get any information from this alone because it all depends on what was the initial assessment. Was the patient initially assessed to be fit for a sphincter preserving surgery? That we do not know. So unless we know that, it is difficult to say whether the patient had to undergo an APR because he was put on a watch and wait. Uh, yeah. The next thing, second speaker had mentioned that there was uh, at least a 7% no positive incidence even if it was a YP P0. So please remember all these studies were earlier studies where surgery was done within 6 to 8 weeks after uh, radiation. You are likely to have some residual disease in the primary tumor or the nodes if you operate within 6 to 8 weeks. The reason for TNT and delayed surgery is because the longer you wait after radiation, the higher is the chance of getting a complete clinical response. So if you had waited for 12 weeks or more after radiation and then looked at how many of these YPN0 actually had YP, y, uh, how many of the YPT0 had a node negative disease, you would probably find that it's a very, very small proportion. So that is not uh, a reliable study in this context. Uh, Again, the second speaker had mentioned a very high incidence of distant metastasis around 36% after watch and wait, which is again wrong <coughs> because the first speaker had correctly mentioned the results of the international watch and wait database where they had mentioned that the incidence of distant metastasis is around 8 to 9%, which is what you would expect if you had operated on a patient with a pathological complete response. Here you are equating a pathological complete response to com clinical complete response. If you operate on a patient with a pathological complete response, the incidence of distant metastasis is around 8 to 9 percent, which is more or less the same if you kept the patient on observation also. Again, the guidelines, if you look at the NCCN guidelines and the ESMO guidelines, they do mention that there is a place for watch and wait, provided they are done in experienced centers. So, slowly the world is coming around to accept watch and wait as one of the treatment options. I wouldn't say it is a standard of care, but it is one of the treatment options in the major guidelines provided it is done in experienced centers. Two other points. The second speaker had mentioned about physician hesitancy on uh, taking up this watch and wait. What about the patient's side? There is a very good... Uh, paper that has looked at patient preference in which nearly 64% of patients would rather die than undergoing a surgery with a permanent stroke. So you need to understand what the patient wants. The patients are now pushing for a watch and wait approach. Physicians may be hesitant, but patients are pushing for a watch and wait approach. So you need to have a clear grasp of which patients are likely to be included for a watch and wait approach before you discuss this issue with the patient. And finally, it is wrong to assume that Indian patients will not be suitable for a watch and wait because they are not reliable for follow-up, which is again wrong. Indian patients are uh, so much uh, against having a permanent stroma. So they, they are likely to be highly motivated to come for frequent follow-up, if only to avoid a surgery with a permanent stroma. I've had this experience multiple times in my own practice and patients seem to be more likely to be included in the trial that we are running at this institute of a watch and wait because they would have otherwise needed a surgery with a permanent stroke. Of course, 
the the uh, finances associated with uh, frequent uh, MRI scan and endoscopy has to be kept in mind. But you must not uh, dissuade patients from a watch and wait approach, or you must not consider that Indian patients will not come for regular follow. So these are a few points that I wanted to mention. Anyway, both of you have done a good job. Once again, please remember, stick to the time and stick to your ambit. Do not waste too much time in a debate talking about the evolution and the history of the topic that you are talking about. Come straight to the point, present your form, present your cause. Thank you. Uh, Rama, that's uh, fantastic. You know, superb. Uh, I, I, it's, it's beautiful coverage. Very balanced view what you gave. Students, uh, you know, you are lucky to have both Jagannath and Rama today to analyze it. This is what it takes, you know, uh, a vast experience of two decades of following uh, a colorectal cancer evolution and all the trials, understanding the pros and cons, reading every trial by line to line and reading the every result that is put in the table and able to interpret. You know, hats off to both of you. Uh, please make use of this. It's outstanding uh, analysis, very balanced view. Because science is evolving. We might have not reached the best way of wait and watch, but we are reaching there. And the whole concept, as explained by Rama, is very, very important to understand. Uh, and students, both of you did outstanding job. Because remember, collecting the data, putting on a PowerPoint to initiate the stimulus discussion is the toughest point. Having put there... Uh, it's easy for experts because they have been in analyzing this over two decades. Uh, fantastic. Uh, there are some questions that are left uh, in the chat box and also Q&A. Uh, Jagannath and Ramakrishna, can you just open them and complete it? So uh, that would be outstanding. Yeah, Dr. Divyang had asked, is there no way to predict even with reasonable surety who would achieve a complete That's what I said. The triple assessment fairly accurately predicts who is going to have a complete response. But as of now, if your question is, before starting treatment, can you predict if this patient is going to have a complete response? The answer is no. But there are some clues which may tell you that this patient is unlikely to have a clinical response, complete response. So don't uh, attempt an organ preservation strategy for this. That is what I had stressed upon when I told you about patient selection, uh, circumferential tumors, uh, tumors that are more than T3B, these are unlikely to have a complete clinical response. Similarly, mucinous tumors and signatory cell tumors, I'm not saying they may not have, they are, they are likely to have a complete clinical response, but the problem is in assessing by MRI whether they have a complete clinical response. So if your question is, at the beginning of treatment, can we predict patients who would receive a complete clinical response? The answer is not very accurate. Uh, Dr. Ramakrishna, uh, yeah. I think a lot of lot of excellent points have been brought out, and uh, even even I I learned little more uh, than what actually. Uh, actually, another thing, you know, I just wanted to bring it out. Notice the you know the age and gender bias here. Because most of the time, you know, this mucinous and signet ring, we tend to see in, a, you know, in Indian context, a lot of young patients in, I have seen at 16 year age group to till 40, you know, this is a very, uh, you know, the, uh, where the breadwinner of the entire family, then also with respect to the, you know, females, somehow the, the husband forces them and please undergo the surgery and all that. But when it comes to, you know, the male accepting the surgery, it is a little, you know, it is, uh, you know, controlled by himself rather than any family members. I think we tend to see uh, more in weight and watch policy in youngsters and uh, male, male population. Uh, but as you said, a uh, lot of things that, uh, you know, the selection uh, and type of the lesion, especially, you know, exophytic lesions, small and stock-like lesions, and those cases which are amenable for digital rectal examination and all that, those are the cases. I think a lot of uh, medical gastro has taken a lot of role in that, doing a regular, you know, uh, endosono and also taking a lot of biopsies. And even our excellent, you know, uh, radiology imaging, especially with the MRI and uh, TRG scoring and all that, probably uh, there should not be bias in reporting by single pathologist or single radiologist. 
in a institutional practice as you said perfectly i think uh, more patients are uh, recruited off now i think yes it's also uh, important to consider the side effects of surgery and side effects of radiation uh, the speakers had alluded to that you should not offer chemo radiation hoping for a watch and wait approach when it is unlikely to happen uh, just because the patient wants it because side effects of chemotherapy and radiation are long term may not be short term but they are long term peripheral neuropathy and most of it is irreversible peripheral neuropathy is irreversible with the oxalic platin the uh, radiation enteritis caused by radiation is a major problem if you follow up the patient's long term there is a side effects of surgery the quality of life is usually short term the major loss improves over a period of 1 to 2 years you must also consider in mind what are the likely side effects if a patient is suitable for surgery alone why offer him chemotherapy and radiation and add up to his toxicity these are things that need to be considered and there is a final question by dr nikunj on full thickness excision well, that is a different uh, topic uh, altogether but there are studies now where uh, uh, that are looking at full thickness local excision uh, as an organ preserving strategy Uh, it is a promising approach, but there are some downfalls to it. The uh, wound complications are slightly higher, and if you are forced to convert to a TME based on the final histopathology report, the chances of uh, doing an APR is higher than when uh, the patient initially presented. So these are a few points to keep in mind regarding full thickness local excision. fantastic uh, thank you very much both of you and you know it's it's very 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 beautifully eluded uh, i remember the new trials are started looking at local excision but as uh, rama says uh, the complications it's not easy to do a local excision in a post rt and finally you actually end up sometime with uh, complication of the local excision which itself refutes the whole purpose of wait and watch and you have a pathological cr you end up doing a local you know surgery radical surgery uh, thank you very much it's a very very beautifully analyzed my heartfelt thanks to both ramkrishna and jagannath and i know avnish couldn't join uh, you know he really missed uh, he message me uh, thanks uh, nikunar very beautiful way you analyze this is what is you know like the super specialty surgical oncology students not just taking a chapter and reading but uh, taking a debate of both and analyzing pros and cons and knowing both ways because the coin has got two ways uh, thank you very much uh, thanks uh, rama thanks jagannath and uh, over to you navneet ji thank, thank you sir. thank you very much trainees and faculty members for joining thank you bye